right we're just praying together let's have a prayer lord we thank you for hearing such a helpful talk to interpret the bible it's a great challenge because this passage is very controversial to many people so i pray lord that you will help us by the holy spirit to affirm what the scriptures say even if we don't all see it the same way help us to love one another but also help us to listen very carefully to what you're saying in your word so we thank you for your word we thank you for what arthur shared about it the importance of being like jesus growing in maturity well that's what the hebrew writer wants his listeners to do as well so we thank you that it all fits together in an amazing way so lord please bless us and encourage us as we get into your word for this short time now in jesus name amen i should have said I'll go back to chapter 5 and 11, because from 5 verse 11 down to 6, 12 is a whole unit of thought. And the unit of thought is a warning against apostasy. If you look at this screen, I'm only going to use two screens tonight. The bottom section there tells you of other warning passages in the book of Hebrews. So I'm just going to read this section. I think it'd be good to read it out loud. I've decided to use the ESV version because I like the way it translates the word baptisms as washings. That will come clear a bit later on. Chapter 5, verse 11, ESV, Hebrews. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Chapter 6, now verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it's impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they then fall away, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. As I said, at the bottom of the screen are the references to other warning passages in the book of Hebrews, a very quick summary of them. Chapter 2, 1 to 4, the danger of neglecting such a great salvation and such a great saviour chapter 3 verses 12 to 19 the danger of having a hardened heart towards the lord and then the final section of five which i read read just a moment the danger of staying immature in your faith very important what arthur said in his talk the importance of growing more mature in your Christian life and becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what will help in trying to explain Hebrews 6 is to remember the context of who is hearing this message first of all. It's essentially Hebrew believers, people who say 
that they have become followers of the Messiah, having been brought up in the Judaistic faith. Now there would be a mixed level of faith and understanding amongst all of them, just as there is a mixed level of faith and understanding amongst any bunch of people meeting around the world. That would also include us. We're at different levels. I'm not saying that as a criticism. I think some of you are more advanced than I am, but we're here to help one another. So the issue I have discovered is that somebody could decide that it would be better for them and it would mean less persecution and less difficulty if they went back into the synagogue, even though they had said that they believed Jesus was the Messiah. You see, in the Roman Empire, Judaism is still being allowed as a protected faith in the Roman Empire. Now, if someone went into the synagogue, having become known as a possible follower of Jesus, they would be expected to publicly deny Jesus and say, I deny that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. So that's a very important moment for a person to do. And that might come under, as far as I can see, the understanding of what apostasy is. And this is talking about people who are drifting so far and turning away so strongly that they become apostates. So we're trying to avoid using it as a pretext to hit people on the head over. And actually, I'm encouraged that one of my deepest heroes, though he long dead before I ever came along, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, once called himself an Arminian Calvinist or a Calvinist Arminian. So there you go. That decides it, really, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, moving on, the correct use of this text, trying to be honest and giving a careful explanation of it and an application of it. If you take a different view, God bless you if you will test it against the scripture for yourself. Now, these are very challenging verses. I've discovered there are four main views about this passage in chapter six. First of all, view number one, this is about Christians losing their salvation. View number two, this is a hypothetical situation to warn people, but it would never actually happen. View number three, this only refers to these first century Jewish background believers. View number four, this is about professing Christians who were never actually born again or regenerate. And that would include Jewish people who were believing in Jesus or said they did. And it would also include Gentile believers who said they did. So now I want to say a little bit about apostasy. It's from a Greek word, apostasia. Now, this definition of apostasy comes from William MacDonald. William MacDonald wrote some marvellous commentaries called the Believer's Commentaries. There's an Old Testament one and a New Testament one. And I must admit, when I want to really try and understand the Bible and I want to see what good, sincere, God-fearing scholars have said, I find William MacDonald extremely helpful. Now, William MacDonald defines apostasy as is written up on the screen. Someone who knowingly, maliciously and willfully turns against Jesus, joining Jesus' enemies. So it's much more serious, much more serious than someone getting in a backslidden state. That's why it talks about impossibility a bit later on. Now, apostasy, originally apostasia, meant rebellion against an established authority. In a Christian sense, it's rebellion against the Lord's authority. What's it caused by? It could be caused by people feeling if we continue to say we're Christians, we'll be heavily persecuted, we could die. It could be encouraged, sadly, by false teaching. 
it could be caused by people teaching wrong views of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it could be caused by people not believing and having unbelieving hardened hearts. So an apostate, as I understand it, is someone who's heard the gospel. They may profess that they believe. They may even join an assembly of believers, but they in the end abandon the faith, they desert fellowship, and they join the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ and may actually even start speaking against him. So it's knowingly, maliciously and willfully turning against the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the same as being a backslider. It's much more devastating than that. I would suggest that if you are concerned about your spiritual state, when you read Hebrews 6, you are not an apostate because you care about the state you're in. And that's a positive thing. You see, the enemy can use these verses to condemn all of us and make us doubt our actual salvation too much. So there's a distinction, you see, I think, between the work of the Holy Spirit in pointing out what's wrong and what the enemy does. Now, this illustration is not my illustration. It's an illustration I heard from an American preacher called Ron Dunn many, many years ago on a tape. This is the difference. Can you imagine if you're a car driver or you're a passenger, the red light on your dashboard? The red light comes on when there's something wrong with the engine. Now, I admit to you, when I first started driving, I preferred to ignore the red light, but the red light flashes and then it starts staying on all the time because the problem hasn't been resolved. Usually what my problem was, because I started by driving old bangers, was that the oil problem was in the engine. My Mini often had an oil problem. And I tended to ignore it because I didn't know what to do until I realised I've got to do something about this or my car won't work anymore. So the Holy Spirit is like a red light shining and pointing out graciously and gently to you your fault. If you ignore it, the red light comes on a bit more and the Holy Spirit moves to convict you, but not to kill you or condemn you. Ron Dunn says what the enemy does is get row hold of your throat and try and strangle you. That's the difference. The Holy Spirit is gracious. Satan is a deceiver, hates you as a Christian, and is trying to destroy you and kill you. So that's the difference, and that may help us as we go through these verses. Right, eyes down, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1. It's about maturity, maturity, maturity. Go forward in your faith. Please go forward, you Hebrew believers. Don't go backwards into the old system and the old rituals that you were brought up in. Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ completely. You leave behind the beginning elementary things. Move on to the solid meat. Don't just rely on the milk all the time. Now, all those doctrinal statements that were mentioned there are true of the Old Testament. It taught all of those things. I'll explain a bit more fully when we get to verse 2. These are the Old Testament foundational platform beliefs, which point eventually, as Hebrews 1 tells you, to the full revelation of God in his son. A good starting point, but you need to know the Messiah personally. You need to be born again of the Holy Spirit. Advance from the basics into maturity. Move on from the elementary truth Move from the milk to the meat, to the solid food. 6 verse 2. These are doctrinal foundations laid out in the Old Testament. 
These are the shadows that point towards the reality. Please don't go back to the shadow. Stay in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, here come the examples. He talks about repenting from dead works, which would have been devoid of faith. The prophets of the Old Testament consistently said this. I'll just give you one example. Amos chapter 5, verses 11, sorry, verses 21 to 24. I'll say that again to correct myself. Amos 5, 21 to 24. A very quick summary in my notes of what those verses say. I hate and despise your feasts. I don't delight in your solemn assemblies. Let justice roll like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. I was asked to attend the Methodist Conference of 1990 in Cardiff, and I realised that that was what God was saying to my heart because they were discussing very ethical and sexual issues, but they would not make a biblical decision. And as I was sitting the final day of being in that conference, God spoke to me from that verse and said, I hate these solemn assemblies which will not follow the word of God. And I've told you that honestly, and that was a momentous moment in my life because I knew I would have to get out. I'm going to move on. You need to repent from trusting the Old, Old Testament sacrificial system. You don't need the sacrifices of Leviticus anymore. There is now a perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't go back to the old system of sacrifice taught in the Old Testament. That's pointing towards Jesus. I'll go back to my little outline so you can see where I'm going. I'm still talking about this warning passage and saying it's right to take it seriously. Faith toward God. Well, we need the saving faith of relying and clinging and throwing ourselves upon the Lord Jesus Christ, God's son. What about the baptisms or washings, as the ESV puts it? Ceremonial cleansing. If you were involved in any kind of service in the Old Testament, you had to wash yourselves. What's happening now for those who really believe in Jesus? Jesus has washed me by his grace. I am clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. I am being washed continuously in one sense by the power of the scripture in my life. I am clean now through grace alone, Christ alone, through faith alone. Laying on of hands, that's talked about as a ceremony of a way of vicarious atonement conducted by the priest, Leviticus 3.2. But I've now got an atoning sacrifice, one, the only one I need, for there's only one mediator between man and God, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't need a priestly sacrifice on my behalf. The high priest has already given himself once and for all time. The resurrection of the dead. You see, that's taught and implied in the Old Testament. I'll give you two, well, one reference, the best one. Job 19, 25 to 27. I know that my Redeemer lives. That has now been fully realised in the Lord Jesus Christ. When I take Mr. Baskerfield's funeral next Monday, I can say categorically from the Bible, Mr. Baskerfield is in the presence of Jesus and will receive a resurrected body when the Lord comes for his people. That's the great resurrection hope because Jesus, the firstborn from the dead, has won for us a glorified and resurrected existence in a body when he chooses to give it to us at his return. 6 verse 3. God wills this. You need to cooperate with his will. As you surrender your will, 
and you submit your will to the Lord Jesus Christ, he will carry out his purpose of maturing you. So surrender and submit to him. Don't rebel like apostates. Be real believers who are submitted and surrendered to him. Right, 6-4. Here's the battleground verse. This is where the battleground is. This is where Christians strongly disagree what's being said here. It'll become obvious to you as I talk about these words, what view I hold. That doesn't mean I'm perfectly correct and you're wrong if you take a different view, but I'm giving you my honest and sincere understanding of this verse. Right. Impossible. A second repentance is not possible. But there's no mention of saving faith in Christ alone in this verse. So therefore, it could mean someone who's only professed faith has never actually experienced a personal relationship being born again in their life. Enlightened. What does that mean? They've heard it in their mind, but they're unregenerate in their heart. What about Judas Iscariot? I mean, Judas was one of the twelve. Judas was involved in ministry, as far as I understand it. He was sent out with another one in twos, and they carried out amazing works of God. And yet Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus and left him. Was used, of course, under God's sovereignty to bring about the crucifixion. But he betrayed Jesus. What about tasted? Well, where you can taste something without actually eating and digesting it. So this could also refer to a professor, someone professing Christianity, but has never actually known the Lord. Shared in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts and challenges unbelievers but unless they repent truly and receive the lord jesus christ they're not indwelt by him and true christians are indwelt by the holy spirit now verse five in chapter six yeah these are the battleground verses tasted drawn and moved but here you could remember Jesus' famous parable of the seeds and the four different soils. Some people show an emotional reaction, but it doesn't last. On Sunday afternoon, two of us took a service, led a service, which was a carol service, in the Methodist Church in St. Earth. There were 150 people there. Their usual congregation is 15. Because the community choir, which contained a number of Christians, sang one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life, which is the Cornish carol, Elizabeth. If you know what I'm talking about, you know how beautiful it is. And because many of that choir are Christians, we had the privilege of preaching the gospel after that marvellous and wonderful carol written by a blind man anyway a man at the end as we were saying goodbye to people said do you know he said when david and you were talking about 1 timothy 3:16 as the text you could hear a pin drop you could hear a pin drop when we preached in st earth i have no idea what people will do with it i do not know if any of them became Christians because of that word but they've heard it but they need to be born again of the Holy Spirit so they in one sense tasted a meeting where the Holy Spirit was working but what are they going to do with it today I had ordered a book which tells the full story of the last revival in the United Kingdom which was in the island of Lewis and Harris in the Hebrides. There are a number of myths the writer is demolishing, but he does it out of great sympathy 
many, many people on those islands were deeply affected by the spiritual awakening, but not all of them were saved. Even in a revival, people can be deeply moved and affected, but they do not necessarily become Christians. It's obvious now to all of you what view I hold. I'll say that clearly in a moment. You don't have to agree with it. That's fine. But I'm going to be honest and tell you that's the view I'm taking. This is about professing believers who've never really turned to Jesus. Moving on, it talks about powers, experiencing powers. They saw miracles. Judas Iscariot saw miracles. May have participated in them, been there. What about that one leper who came back after all of them had been cleansed and only one came back to thank Jesus and Jesus said, you are truly clean now because you came back to thank me. Jesus pointed it out in John 6, verse 26. Verse 6 of chapter 6 is about the apostates. I've explained already, I'll show it again, what I think apostasy is. I don't think it's backsliding. I don't think it's people who are just drifting a bit. I don't think it's people who've lost fellowship, but they need to get back into fellowship. They need to do what Arthur said, study and apply the Bible in their life and obey it. That's got to be true of all of us, including me. Deliberate malicious spurning of the Lord Jesus Christ, actual betrayal and constant verbal denial, in fact, even preaching against him, as if it's not true. What they once professed, they believed. It's obvious now what my view is. I think view four. This is about professing believers who never really knew the Lord. You see, when I believed in Jesus Christ with all my heart, I think God made a legal declaration about me and justified me by faith. I find it very difficult to accept that he could rubbish that and wipe it out and say I'm lost. But I must preserve and endure in my faith. I totally accept that. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. Sam endured to the end of his life and he's saved. I can say that on Monday about him sincerely and honestly. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that we should sit back in a chair and say, oh, I once prayed a sinner's prayer 40 years ago. I'm fine. Rubbish. Are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ now? with all your heart, a real Christian will continue to do so. And a real Christian would never want to stand in a synagogue and curse Jesus. And they wouldn't want to burn incense to the Roman Caesar just to pacify the opposition and then go back into the church. You never would want to say Caesar is Lord, only Jesus is Lord. See, that's what it's like to be a first century believer. You face real challenges to your faith. It is challenging, these verses, and they can be challenged. And my view can be challenged. I accept that. But my honest, sincere view is number four. And I would just make this comment that I think we live in increasing times of apostasy in the mainline denominations of this nation. And we have to stand firm, hold fast, cling to, rely on Jesus, and we really need each other. We really need the love of our other sincere believers. Right, now he gives an illustration from nature, chapter 6, verses 7 to 8. He talks about rain coming on the land. The rain comes on the land, it replenishes it, and it invigorates it. But you've got two types of different reactions. He talks about believers producing fruit, the blessings, the usefulness of them, the fact that they will be commended by the Lord. Then the unbelievers produce thorns and thistles and they bring forth a curse and they're worthless and they'll be burned. One Jewish Christian writer I have read says this whole passage 
emphasizes that it's incredibly important to move these Hebrew believers to trust and keep on trusting the one perfect sacrifice of the cross. That's what he wants them to do. Well, I'm going to read the last bit of the chapter. Won't talk about it in such length and depth. This is Hebrews chapter 6 now, verse 13. Sorry, verse 9 onwards, sorry. Verse 9 onwards. I think verse 9 is a crucial statement in the middle of what's gone on here. Listen to what he says about them now. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. I think the writer to Hebrews is saying, you people who I'm writing to, I don't think are going to become apostates. I believe better things about you. Verse 10, for God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So he's encouraging them. He calls them beloved. Apparently, the famous Methodist minister, W.E. Sangster, always called the congregation Beloved. And there's a lovely man who runs the church at Baldew called Roy Davey, and he calls his congregation Beloved. It's a lovely thing to say about Christians, isn't it? My Beloved, the believers who have lives that manifest salvation. There's comfort and exhortation going together in biblical encouragement. I love the story of what's on the Bayou Tapestry. Apparently, on the Bayou Tapestry, you can see William the Conqueror comforting his troops. What William's doing is prodding them with a stick to fight. So comfort includes within it exhortation. It's not just tapping people on the head, oh dear, oh dear, you're so lovely. It is actually to prod people into growing, into being mature. So preaching and teaching might include sometimes a bit of a prod into people. Verses six, verse 10, the salvation they have is proven by their work and their love. The work is your deed, your actions, your practical conduct, your true spiritual condition. The AV talks about labour, not the political party, but labouring, which is toil. And there's toil in the Christian life. It is a toil, but we want to do it joyously, for us to do eight continuous Christingles. But we got another four to go, and the Lord will give us strength to do it. And tomorrow we'll go down there with a fresh attitude and we'll crack on. Verse 11, earnestness and assured hope. I looked up what the words mean in the original language. Earnestness is eagerness. Here's an interesting one. It means busyness. It means diligence to go forward. Everyone I know who is a faithful and effective Christian is busy about the Lord's work. Yes, of course, we've got to rely on the Lord. Of course, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But you've got to show an active part in doing it. I remember George Ver was saying, you've got to get up in the morning and read the Bible. God doesn't pour the scripture into you just while you lie there. Well, he could do, but he gets, come on, get up and read it for yourself. Assured hope. The Greek is an entire confidence in anticipating God's certain victory and God's certain reign. I've got an assured hope. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun, etc., etc. Verse 12, press on. Don't be sluggish. Be imitators and inherit the promises of God. Show confidence and patience. Now, in verses 13 to 20, he shows how God keeps his promises. 
He's quoting what happened in Genesis 22, 16 to 17 with Abraham. He uses Abraham, obviously an absolute key figure in the Old Testament, someone who's an absolute key figure in Judaism. So these Jewish Hebrew believers would have immediately been attracted when he mentions Abraham. I mean, Abraham must be in the top five Old Testament people. Maybe Moses first and Abraham or the other way around. He uses the human example of making an oath. God doesn't need to make an oath, but to prove the power of his promise, he makes an oath on his own name. How much more do we need to have confidence in when God says he'll do something? In one of my Bibles that I use, I have a quote from Hudson Taylor. God speaks and he means what he says and he does what he says he will do. It's not like the government. He does what he says he'll do. This is God. God keeps his word. Now, he then uses four illustrations to drive home that we can rely on the word and the oaths of God. The city of refuge is mentioned. You flee to God's city out of a fallen world. Talks about an anchor. An anchor keeps you from drifting on the ways of doubt and despair. Talks about a forerunner. The Lord Jesus Christ has gone into the glory and has made an entrance for us to join him in the glory. And then he comes to the high priest who I kept mispronouncing last week in my Cornish way, but I've been informed how to pronounce it correctly. But I'm not going to say in case I get it wrong. The high priest, this eternal priesthood, because he eternally saves us. We're saved by his death and we're preserved by his life in us. They that endure to the end shall be saved. The truly saved shall endure to the end. He alone is our hope. He alone will see us home. I want you to hold fast because he's holding you fast. So in conclusion, having talked to some absolutely lovely people who take a different view to me, I'm going to call them our minions because it's easy to say that but I'm not criticising them at all. I get the Arminian magazine every month from the United States of America. And, you know, I'm one of the only people when the bookshop was open who read both Evangelical Times and Evangelicals Now. So I must be a very balanced person. We all pray similarly, actually. You see, I think when I'm praying for someone who seems to have wandered off, they were never saved in the first place. That would be my view. But others who disagree with me would say they need to be saved from becoming apostates. So we're all praying that these people will get to Jesus. So we can even agree, even if we disagree on understanding the passage. We all want people to mature and to grow. So I think you can keep the bond of unity in the Lord Jesus Christ and you can love with sincerity other Christians who take a different view because they sincerely want to understand the Bible. All of us want maturity. All of us want Jesus to be glorified. Brothers and sisters, we haven't got to fall out over this, but you must be prepared and I totally accept if you take a different view, the Lord bless you. All I've done is try to explain it, try to be honest to the text in my fallibilities, to do all the things that Arthur said about interpreting a text properly and to try and tell you that's what I honestly think. I think it's about professing Christians who never were truly born again. And yet God is able to save. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen.